hello and welcome to Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. Today I am going to be talking about a, a HAP project that I finished, which is not Fair Isle, it's a lace. Um, and I'm really excited that I finished it. <laughs> this today I'm wearing my uh, Vermont sweater, which is just like a plain raglan sweater, um, similar to the vanilla sweater um, from the Woolly Thistle, but it is, this is in DK weight, although the gauge is probably the same. It's about 20 stitches over four inches. Maybe this is more like 18, but if you're looking for a great vanilla raglan pattern, the Willy Thistles vanilla sweater is great because it's actually an adaptable gauge for like anywhere between worsted and fingering weight yarn. If you knit at with different needle sizes and you are interested in different levels of drapiness, so it's very versatile pattern. Um, okay, I'm going to be talking today about my Balfraid hap, which... I saw on the Wooly Thistle channel, because Corrine made one, and I was like, I want to make one of those. So it's knitted with um, Daughter of a Shepherd Heritage, which looks like that. It's a dark Hebridean yarn, um, natural. There's um, some Swart Bloods mixed in with this. If you have ever watched John Arbin's YouTube channel, wow, it's Wooly, um, which I, I um, recommend you do because it's great. There's an interview with John and Rachel of Daughter of a Shepherd, and they're talking about how um, how they like were working on the wool and how she sent them all this Hebridean wool, and he was like, I couldn't use it. I needed to like, well, he could use it, but he needed to blend it with like something that was like slightly, um, I don't know anything about spinning, so let's just say better for the spinning machines. And so he blended it with a little bit of Swart Bois, which is the same color. It, I mean, essentially, they're both like dark, natural colored sheep. Um, and then they came up with this, and it's amazing. Um, it's worsted spun, very, very thin, high yardage. It says 400 yards slash meters. I don't know which one, because I don't have the tag um, per um, skein, but I think it's um, I think it's more than that. I think it's like 100 grams. I think it's probably closer to 500 <laughs> yards. Um, so you get a lot of bang for your buck. And I knit this, I got the smaller size of the Belbride Hap, um, which is a free pattern by Rita Taylor on, it's from Blacker Yarns. Um, I will link it in the show notes. And I actually, this is not 100 grams. So I didn't have 100 total grams of the first ball, but then I got another ball because I got them both in the Wooly Thistle selection boxes the in 2021 and 2020. So I had two skeins and I didn't know how much I was going to need. So I had about 75 grams of the first one left. And so I started with that one and then I needed the second one. And it turns out that this is 97 grams. So if you have one skein, you might be a stretch depending on your gauge, but you can pretty much do it. One thing that I slightly regret about this is that I was not super careful with the applied border and it's not like at a point, it kind of, like the points like off center a little bit and I probably could have dealt with that with blocking pins but I could only find my blocking combs which are like the knitter's pride combs which are really great if you're doing something flat across but not great for lace because with lace you really with like edges you really want to pull them out and use a t-pin but I couldn't find my t-pins and it was already in the water so I was like okay well it doesn't matter no one's gonna look at that and say voila it's not in the middle um and yeah, so it was actually really fun to knit. Basically to knit a hap like this, you knit this garter triangle, or some, in some cases that's a whole square because you're doing a whole square hap. Like Gudrun Johnston's um, belt, no, the, the, what's it called? The Hansel hap that has options for the triangle or the full square, which is super cool if you want like a doubled shawl to put over your shoulders or you could use it as a blanket. Um, so you knit this triangle first and you start with you know, typically it's like two stitches or three stitches and you make yarn overs at the edges here, which you can see there. And the yarn overs are very useful because you actually pick the, the stitches, like instead of picking up stitches, you just like knit through the yarn over. And so you can see every stitch you need to pick up because it's a yarn over. And that is so cool. That's like one of my favorite things about haps is that you pick up stitches. Um, when you're picking up stitches, you're just picking up yarn overs. So you can count them super easily. You can count the yarn overs to make sure you have the right number. Um, and you can, it's like, it's hard to miss one, even, especially in such a yarn that's so dark. Um, I tend to knit in a big, um, big comfy, like, chair, 
I have this big like Barca lounger kind of chair with like you can pull a lever it a feet thing come up and it's uh, it's very old I got it at a like a secondhand store for like $30 um, but it's really comfy and it has a big light and the biggest reason that I have to knit in that chair we got lights my roommates and I got a light at Target for the um, for the couch but there's like a lamp on one side table on the couch and then there's a spotlight on the other side of the couch but it's like one of those like there's like a bigger light at the top and then there's a spotlight but the, the bulb's not very bright so uh I can sit there if I don't need to be like looking at my knitting but I am a person who's very concerned about my eyes when knitting because I look at you knitting a lot and I'm 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 already I need to wear glasses already so I need to be able to see with a Hebridean yarn especially you want good light and it really helps to have um yarn overs to pick up so you don't have to like stare at the stitches like anyway um so then you've got this whole knitting along here basically so this is garters this triangle is garter stitch and then you do a kind of stock and at least section here and there's four you did it four times one two three four and in some of the samples those are in four different colors which is gorgeous um and i would consider doing that um i don't i guess i could use jameson and smith two ply this is a worsted spun yarn. This is more like Heritage from Jameson and Smith. Um, so if I were gonna knit a half, I'd probably choose Heritage just because the lace will um, drape better because it's worsted spun. Um, but there's no harm in using wool and spun. You might just wanna block it more often because it might kind of spring back due to the nature of that yarn. Um, again, because I'm not a spinner, I can't really explain to you why that happens. Um, but I know that worsted spun yarns, from experience, will act better as lace because they will keep their shape open and they will drape better because the fibers are all combed in the same direction. Um, yeah. So, um, then when that's done, then you have to do this applied border at the bottom, which you can see those diamonds there. And I thought that was going to involve picking up stitches, but it doesn't. It just involves leaving all those stitches on the needle and that from this applied border and then you basically go back and forth on another needle and you knit every other row you get back to the the part of the row where there's still stitches attached and you just knit two together with one of those stitches so there's 200 and some stitches on this needle and you have to go back and forth um maybe there's 100 and some stitches on the needle. there were a lot of stitches on the needle and you have to go back and forth yeah 250 sometimes basically 500 rows of this apply border, but it's only like 18 stitches. So I would generally just try to, there were 20, I think I had to do it 29 times total. And I would try to do like four in a row. Cause it's, it's pretty quick. You could do four. I could do four in like half an hour and it's garter lace. So you're not purling. Um, and I was actually impressed that I didn't hate the purling part of the, um, the second part of the shawl with the sections. It's again, this is hard to see, <laughs> but this part, with those little eyelets there. Um, yeah, I didn't hate that. I Purling is, my roommate says, purling's not so bad if you just purl in a line. And I'm like, yeah, I guess it's not as bad like ribbing. I get into a rhythm with ribbing because I have to do it so much, I guess. So I guess you just kind of forget at some point, like if I knit ribbed DK socks, the whole sock is ribbed. Like two by two rib and whatever, it doesn't bother me in theory. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I don't, I do enjoy lace. Um, I find lace to be a very fun challenge, especially if you use stitch markers. And when I first started knitting lace, I didn't use stitch markers. Um, and I like, I don't know, the simple lace, so I guess it didn't matter as much. I didn't really mess up a lot, but yeah, it's, it's better to use stitch markers. If you have a big wide repeat, it's really better if you use stitch markers. So. Um, it's my advice to you with lace. <laughs> Use stitch markers. Most people probably already know that. Um, I'm gonna put it on because one of the reasons that I haven't been knitting shawls in like the last, I knit my mom a shawl some years ago when I was first knit learning lace shawls. Like, I don't know, before I went to grad school, I knit my mom a shawl for Mother's Day. It was purple. It's very nice. Um, and then I knit my really close friend Erin a uh, shawl for her wedding. Um, you've, if you follow me on Instagram, um, <laughs> I always forget to say you can find me on Instagram as Barnaby Nets and Ravelry as eBarnaby93. Um, what, but like in my show notes, my projects are linked, so you'll see, like, it will just take you there. Um, at least to Ravelry. 
Um, I, so Erin is um, one of my closest friends and she lives in Vermont and she's like often in my photos <laughs> because we model. Uh, she has a really nice camera and she edits photos. Um, and so sometimes we do photo shoots and she, we uh, alternate who models and wears the sweaters and who takes the pictures and then she edits them. So I take some of the pictures, but literally all I do is press the button, um, but you can see her. Um, the last one we did, which I've been posting a bunch of photos from, her dog was, was with us and um, she was pretty small then. She was a little puppy, like maybe five months old. They'd just gotten her um, and uh, and now she's so much bigger. And so we see the photos and we're like, wow, Lady was tiny. Um, she's so, she's so fluffy. And so Erin got married um, a year and a half ago and she asked me to make her like a wedding stole. And it was a really nice wedding. It was like 18 people because it was in August of 2020. And um, and we had it outdoors in Vermont in uh, yeah, September of 2020, I guess, because it was, yeah, mid, mid September. Like it's like the 12th of September or something. And um, we did it. This is like the most Vermont thing ever. The wedding took place at this farm and not a farm. It was like a, it's like near a mountain. It's like, a, it's like a B and B um, on this beautiful property. Uh, um, it is technically called a farm, but there's not like, it's not like a working farm. Um, and the people who own the farm are my godmother's son and his wife. <laughs> um, and I figured that out before the wedding and I was like, oh, that's really funny. <laughs> and we like, they were there and we, we stayed in their, in their house and I knew them, it was great. Um, and that was really funny, um, but it was a beautiful wedding and I made her the stole cause it was kind of chilly at night. And so after the wedding, when we were having dinner, she had it all wrapped around her. And I made that in Brooklyn Tweed um, Veil, which is their lace weight worsted spun, and oh, it was so gorgeous. Uh, it took a really long time, but it was worth it because um, it was a labor of love. And it was kind of fun. I did it like I like to do things incrementally and do like a section at a time every day. So I did that. Um, but anyway, to get back to my point, I don't really wear shawls. <laughs> I like to wear cowls and I like to wear. Um, mostly cowls. <laughs> I have double loop cowls, I have the funnel cowls that go right over your head, and I have the like single loop Mobius, Mobius twist cowls. Um, I knit all those types of cowls and I wear them because you don't have to worry about it falling off, like it just kind of sits there. Um, so shawls, I've never liked the idea of shawls because they seem fussy because they can fall off, but I also thought they looked dumb on me. Um, and I just like didn't think about it and then I like finished the shawl because I wanted to make something really nice and sort of Scottish traditional with my daughter of a shepherd heritage. And I had the two balls, so I was like, okay, this is enough. And then I put it on. Let's see, my hair's in the way. And I kind of tucked it up and I was like, that looks really good. <laughs> like, you don't just have to wear it outside. Like, you can just kind of do that. And it's just like, it's really cozy. It looks nice under a jacket. It, you know, you kind of can, Zhuzh it, that's what Andrea Mowry says, right? You zhuzh your shawls. Um, sometimes I tie the little tails a little bit under here so they don't fall off. Um, some people wear it over their shoulders. This is not quite like, doesn't have super long arms or wingspan. Um, you could wear it like this if you're cold. It's not very thick, so. But it does kind of keep your shoulders warm if you're gonna do that. My mom really likes to have a shawl over her shoulders at home because she works at home a lot. Um, and it's cold in the house during the day. So she wears her shawls. Um, this one doesn't quite sit well enough to like, I, like I said, have the wingspan to kind of wrap around and use a shawl pin. Um, but in theory, one could do that. And do that kind of works. Yeah, you could. But my mom likes to, uh, she even like a little over the shoulders kind of capelet thing um, with like wool and mohair just to keep her warm, like at home. And it's like really warm. Um, so that's fun. So yeah, the, the little, sh you know, little wear it however you want. It's like in Little Women, they have the really long ones where they like put like this and then tie them in the back. Um, it's a really good movie. I cried really hard at Little Women when it came, like, when it came out a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed this and I would like to do it again. <laughs> and there's lots of types of hat patterns. I'm sure that eventually people get to the point where they just do their own patterning. Um, I do have a couple of books on Shetland lace. Um, 
but I'm not like at the point, because I'm knit well, one of these, I'm not yet at the point where I'm like, oh, I can throw my own lace pattern in there. Um, maybe I will at some point, but at the moment I'm like, oh, I need to knit somebody else's hat patterns for a while. <laughs> so I'm gonna knit, I think I'm gonna knit Gudrun Johnston's Hansel hat um, because I have that pattern. And um, maybe knit some other ones. I saw this beautiful one that somebody had made because the Wooly Thistle shared it and it was called the, I don't know, shoot. It's, it's from this pattern collection that's based, this is amazing to me because I'm like a weird historian. It's based on um, like manuscript studies. So they're like a bunch of patterns. Again, I'll know link the collection. Um, and they're all called things like, you know, vellum and scriptorium and like things that if you have any background in manuscript studies, you'll recognize all the, um, all the names. Uh, I did a little bit of work. I did, I mean, a little bit of coursework in grad school on um, medieval manuscript study because we had uh, where I went to school, there were a lot of, there was a big rare book collection. And um, it's funny because I was a grad student. They take grad students really seriously sometimes with like grad students ask for rare books. One of my friends is like an actual rare book historian. Um, she's a book historian, but she's doing um, like early modern books. Um, but like they teach, they'll let you teach classes like grad seminars in the center for rare books, the manuscript studies center because they have these big, beautiful classrooms. But like one of the requirements is that you have to like have old books on the table. Like you have to request old books to show your class every single class. So my first semester of grad school, I took a class on the English Reformation. Um, and like we, there was just like a Gutenberg Bible on the table. <laughs> like every, like there was something like that. Like John Fox, um, you know, Acts and Martyrs, just like, that's what it's, that's called, right? I don't know, something like that. Like that's just sitting on the table. like like a first edition of that or like you know from 1500 and some whenever that came out like there were these old books just everywhere and so I did a class on I did a couple of classes on medieval um music kind of like notation and um like different types of things about liturgical music in the medieval era and in one class I got to go to the manuscript library and look at a manuscript like it was an assignment this was so cool and I had to see, like, look at this manuscript, which is from like 1200, maybe 1300. And I had to like write it down and put it in modern notation, <laughs> um, which sounds really uh, probably boring to a lot of people, but like, it was incredible. <laughs> like, so it's in square notations from like, you know, the 13th century. And you have to, you have to translate it into what that would sound like if you were to give it to a musician today and you wanted them to be able to read it. Um, and so I had to like go off. I mean, I could have just taken a picture, but I like, I did it in real time. Like I went to the library and I had this manuscript open and I was allowed to touch it without gloves, which I found crazy. Um, to be fair, like the, the like how high that they used, um, that's a lot stronger than old paper. Like paper, that's, I mean, they didn't want you to like be grabbing it the whole time, like holding on to the edge of a page, but you could, I, they were like, yeah, you can touch that. I was like, I can touch this. <laughs> Like every time they were like, yeah, I mean, you have to, we have this for you to use it. Like, oh my God, I don't have to wear gloves. <laughs> like that just like shocked me every time they were like, yeah, you're a scholar. I was like, am I though? <laughs> Apparently I was. Anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> that, I don't know how I got on that tangent. Oh, the shawl pattern. <laughs> oh yeah. There was a, what's called woodcut. Oh yeah, it's called woodcut, and um, so the shawl called woodcut, and I you have to buy the whole pattern collection. But I was like, twist my arm. I haven't bought it yet. I'm gonna buy that pattern collection because it's beautiful, and I loved that woodcut shawl. And somebody made the woodcut shawl with this same yarn, and I was like, I gotta do that with the yarn. It's so pretty. Oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, and I'm thinking about using a lot of that yarn in my woolly thistle deluxe selection box this year for different shawl projects because there's the Garth and R. Priscelli, there's 100 grams of that, there's the Jagger Spun, 100 grams of that, like that 100 grams is, this is 100, this is 97 grams, there's enough for a decent sized shawl and you can also do like, you can see these have the, like the stripes, you can see like very vaguely here the garter ridges that separate those stripes, so those are all separated by, well you can see the different lace sections if I hold it up, those are all separated by garter ridges and you could do those sections in different colors. So maybe I'll do that.
something like that with maybe a different pattern or maybe the same this is a free pattern so that's cool it is again a lot of free patterns like they assume that you know a lot about how to read charts and how to um, understand abbreviations and they'll tell you you know you will do this and they don't they don't give you like a whole lot of you know information on that technique um, because it's a traditional pattern and again it's free so it does definitely not super great for like beginner lace knitters um, I would work up to it maybe like your third or fourth lace project um, and it's helpful to just kind of understand how a shawl is constructed which again kind of just comes like the shape just sort of manifests itself and for me, I'm always confused about the physics of that. I'm like, how does like, I start here, does it, how does it not grow? Like, what, how does it become a crescent or like a triangle in that way? Because I'm just growing it like it should, I don't know, it's a whole, like why isn't the, do, didn't I start at the point of the triangle? Because that would make more sense, but that's not how it works. You like start here and it grows, like your ends of your rows are like the flat part and it's weird. The whole thing is just strange to me. Um, but yeah, I'm planning on making more of these because it was really fun and a good challenge. And again, I, I said maybe in a previous video that I tend to knit color work because I'm fast at knitting color work and it's really satisfying, especially now that I work full time. It's like I have a lot of projects and, you know, I'm trying to get them off the needles and stuff. But I'm trying to be a little more intentional about my knitting and do some more like cabled projects and do some more lace stuff like this and I really enjoy it so I knit a lot of lace socks um which don't involve purling <laughs> I mean sometimes there's like a purl stitch involved in the in the row but not like a lot of purling like you're not purling back a whole round in a sock so yeah we'll see maybe I'll do some more neckwear now that I like know how much I like it but again, I think I would be more careful with the edging and just be really, um, really aware like of where where the point in the middle needs to be because they designed the pattern so that it's symmetrical. I just don't execute it correctly because I don't know what row I'm on and I don't have the right number of stitches. And sometimes these diamonds aren't whole. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a good time. These are cool. These little lace diamonds on the edge for the applied border so yeah we'll see we'll see uh if more lace emerges in my life but for now it's saturday and it's time to knit so thank you for watching my lace shawl video <laughs> this has been tiny desk knitting with emma bye